Thank you. Uh, Aloha, Austin. Um, thank you to Jaska and to Kako Ito uh, for the opportunity to participate in this very special event. Uh, it is my pleasure and my honor today to introduce Dr. William Tsui. Um, he is a specialist in the economic, environmental, and cultural history of modern Japan. He was educated at Harvard, Oxford, and Princeton universities and is the author or editor of eight books, of which I'll say more in a, in a second. Um, Dr. Tsui has received Fulbright ACLS and Marshall Fellowships, and he was awarded the John Whitney Hall Prize of the Association for Asian Studies in 2000. Uh, he currently serves on the boards of directors uh, for the Association of Japanese Studies, the U.S. Japan Council, and he was appointed to the Japan-United States Friendship Commission in, in 2020. So a very impressive array of, uh, of appointments. Um, and Bill is uh, truly one of the most versatile historians of modern Japan in terms of the range of his abilities and his intellectual interests. Uh, early in his career, he researched Japanese industry, publishing two excellent texts, Manufacturing Ideology, Scientific Management in 20th Century Japan, published by Princeton, and Banking Policy in Japan, published by Rutledge. His attention then turned to popular culture. Uh, Bill has long been an avid fan of the world's favorite radioactive reptile, and his 2004 book, Godzilla on My Mind, 50 Years of the King of Monsters, was called a cult classic by no less than the New York Times. Um, a Japanese translation, Gojireto America no Hanseiki, was published by Chuko Sosho. And that book is currently being featured in Austin at the Godzilla Invasion of Kinokuniya, USA. Um, which is being held in honor of the recent release of the blockbuster film, Godzilla vs. Kong, which I have to admit was better than I expected. <laughs> um, his first Godzilla book was followed up with an amazing collection of academic essays on the topic by leading scholars of Japanese studies that was called In Godzilla's Footsteps, Japanese pop cultural icons on the global stage. Uh, his other books include Japanese Popular Culture and Globalization, and East Asian Olympiads, 1934 to 2008. Very timely work given uh, this summer's COVID Olympics in Tokyo. Dr. Tsutsui's versatility extends to academic administration. After teaching for 17 years at the University of Kansas, he became the Dean of Dedman College of Humanities and Sciences at Southern Methodist University in 2010. From 2014 to 2019, he served as president of Hendricks College in Conway, Arkansas. And he's currently the Edwin O. Reischauer Distinguished Professor of Japanese Studies at Harvard University. Um, Dr. Tsutsui will be assuming the post of university president and CEO at Kansas-based Ottawa University this summer. And on top of all of these talents and gifts, he is widely known as one of the nicest people you'll ever meet in academia. <laughs> um, today, Dr. Tsuzui's talk, as Kako said, is called The Hot Dog of the Sea, Surimi and Kamaboko in Historical and Environmental Perspective. And this topic really demonstrates many of Bill's interests encompassing industry and technology, the popular culture of food, globalization of supply chains, and urgent environmental matters. During this presentation, you can use the function at the top right of your screen. Um, it includes some geometric shapes, a triangle, a square, and a circle. You can use that to post questions, which we can address during the Q&A, which will follow um, the talk. So please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. William Tsutsui. Well, thank you so much, uh, Nancy. I truly appreciate it. Thank you so much, uh, Kako, for uh, inviting me uh, here this evening. It is an honor and a joy uh, to be uh, uh, presenting tonight. It's also great to be back in Austin, if only virtually, and to be part of the programming for Japan Society, which I think so highly uh, of. 
So let's talk a little bit about surimi, the ground washed, treated and frozen, frozen fish protein that is the basis for a wide range of processed foods, ubiquitous in Japan and internationally. It would be difficult to visit Japan today or at any point in our lifetimes and not encounter something manufactured from surimi. Fish paste products, usually known generically as kamaboko, and I'll talk more about terminology uh, in a moment, have deep roots in Japan and are almost unavoidable in school lunches and bento, floating in bowls of noodles, at New Year's and other celebratory meals, as a kid's snack in the form of fish sausage, and bobbing in the broth at the seasonal oden counters in convenience stores. For many non-natives, and increasingly for younger generations of Japanese as well, kamaboko is very much an acquired taste, or more specifically, an acquired texture. The distinguishing characteristic of Japanese fish paste products is their elasticity, a quality called ashi. Politely described by many Westerners as chewy, or more frankly, rubbery. In the interest of full disclosure, I should note that I am one of those people who has scrupulously tried to avoid kamaboko my entire life, and I would also be perfectly content to never again eat that most global, uh, common global foodstuff made from surimi imitation crab, otherwise known as crab legs, as sea legs or crab sticks. Now, surimi and the products manufactured from it went from being a personal culinary aversion to a topic of research interest about eight years ago now, when I happened to meet Paul Josephson from Colby College at an academic conference. Paul introduced me to an article he had published in 2008 called The Ocean's Hot Dog, The Development of the Fish Stick. Even before I'd read the piece, which is a wonderful study of technology and marketing at Gorton's of Gloucester, now a subsidiary of the Japanese seafood conglomerate Nippon Suisan, I recall chiding Paul that the benighted fish stick, though well-deserving of scholarly attention, is not the ocean's hot dog, but instead that Kamaboko is. In any case, from that moment eight years ago, I started collecting citations, clippings, and books related to the Japanese kamaboko industry, but only later would I discover how promising a topic surimi is for exploring the history of Japanese fisheries, the evolution of the global seafood market, the international politics of marine resources, the technological and environmental implications of engineered seafood, and the dynamics of diet and lifestyle in modern Japan. My comments today will pivot on the transformation of kamaboko from a Japanese regional specialty based on local fish catches and small scale artisanal production into a sprawling global industry serving international markets through the integrated mass production of a new processed food commodity, frozen surimi. This transformation was driven by changes in the Japanese diet, commercial opportunities, and by environmental constraints on fisheries production after World War II. It was accelerated by a series of technological breakthroughs and adaptations, most of them made by Japanese fisheries corporations and marine research facilities. And the process was profoundly shaped by resource nationalism and the politics of what's called the Oceanic Enclosure Movement in the North Pacific. The story of surimi offers a unique perspective on one of the central narratives of fisheries and seafood markets in the 20th century, the rise and fall of Japan as the world's leading fishing nation and top exporter of seafood products. It also casts valuable light on shifting consumer preferences, convenience, healthy eating, value in both developing and mature seafood markets. Above all, the history of surimi is a sobering example of Daniel Pauly's notion of fishing down marine food webs, in which fisheries, quote, having depleted the large predatory fish, turn to increasingly smaller species, finally ending up with previously spurned small fish and invertebrates. 
Surimi, even better than the more celebrated, sexier example of tuna, shows how the industrialization of the oceans, the globalization of seafood, and the degradation of marine environments have progressed with inexorable efficiency, thoroughness, and speed over the past half century. There is no better place to start our deep dive into the making of the hot dog of the sea than with terminology. Japanese fish paste products are generically called kamaboko, although kamaboko is also a specific steamed form of such products. The technical term used in Japan is suisan neriseihin, kneaded seafood products, or simply neriseihin. Surimi, as I mentioned a moment ago, is an intermediate product in the manufacture of kamaboko. To use a somewhat charged metaphor, surimi is to kamaboko what ammoniated beef, aka pink slime, was for many years to Taco Bell burritos. Kamaboko has a long history in Japan. Legend has it that kamaboko was first cooked up by the questionably historical Empress Jingu, who also happened to be the first woman featured on a Japanese banknote, although presumably not for her culinary inventiveness. The generally accepted story, traced by the enthusiastic fish paste historian Shimizu Wataru through a series of manuscripts and scrolls, is that the first recorded mention of kamaboko was during the Heian period, when a product resembling what is now called chikuwa was reportedly served at a court banquet in the year 1115. Despite persistent suggestions that fish paste was actually introduced to Japan from China or Southeast Asia, perhaps through Okinawa, the Japan Kamaboko Association has enthusiastically embraced the Heian Genesis date, establishing November 15th, 1115, as National Kamaboko Day. 2015 was accordingly celebrated as the 900th anniversary of Kamaboko, and in the feverish world of processed foods marketing in Japan, a campaign was immediately launched to excite consumers about the impending millennium of fish paste. In any case, despite the efforts of Kamaboko boosters to stress its elite culinary origins, there are clearly very practical reasons for the development of fish paste products. Grinding meat with salt and cooking it was a useful means of extending the shelf life of fish in a pre-refrigerated world. And even though kamaboko has not always been made with the least desirable raw materials, either in terms of fish species or freshness, it is unquestionably, in the spirit of the hot dog of the sea, a convenient vehicle for dodgy ingredients. As one earnest food scientist put it, quote, even small fish, fish with bad taste, fish with many bones, and fish with grot grotesque appearances can be eaten by processing into kamaboko. The making of kamaboko is straightforward, if tedious and tiring in the days before mechanization. Traditionally, the meat was removed from fish and minced. It was washed with water and then squeezed dry using a hemp cloth before being ground with salt in a stone mortar and pestle. The resulting paste, fresh surimi, could then be steamed and shaped, boiled, or baked. This process removes oils, impurities, and water-soluble proteins from the ground meat, leaving a high concentration of other proteins, which, when heated, form an elastic gel. These proteins break down or denature quickly after a fish dies, so the fresher the raw materials used, the better the elastic texture. Significantly, come the 20th century, freezing fish also has the effect of denaturing proteins, meaning kamaboko manufacturers remain dependent on fresh or relatively fresh fish, even in an age of emerging refrigerated cold chains. And just to complicate things further, not all types of fish have the same gel-forming properties. Some, especially white fish like croaker, are rich in the desirable proteins, while others, especially oily, dark-fleshed fish, 
cannot yield the kind of snappy ashi that Kamaboko connoisseurs crave. A remarkable diversity of local variations of Kamaboko emerged across Japan as makers developed products based on local fish catches, other readily available local ingredients, and local taste preferences. Japan's rich Kamaboko foodways have been compared justifiably to the elaborate cultures of cheese or wine in Europe. In Odawara, famous for its fish paste, Okigisu, or whiting, was made into itatsuke kamaboko, the now iconic half-round shape on a wooden board famed for its brilliant whiteness, glossy sheen, and strong ashi. In Edo, the specialty was hampen, a fluffy boiled kamaboko made from shark meat and mashed yam. In Toyohashi, it was chikuwa, with its distinctive bamboo tube shape and made from lizard fish. Yaizu is associated with the pink swirled Narutomaki, which is one of only two Neri Seihin to rate its own emoji. And in Kagoshima, influences from Okinawa gave birth to deep fried kameboko, now known generally as Satsuma Age. Over the last 50 years, the plasticity of surimi has allowed for the fabrication of a mind-numbing range of what are called analog products, engineered imitations of more costly foods. The most successful of these has been kanikama, or crab sticks, of which more uh, in a moment. One of the strangest is surimi-based matsutake mushrooms, and among the most recent is an unagi substitute developed in response to the soaring prices and dwindling populations of freshwater eels. Now, legendary empresses and Heian banquets notwithstanding, it was only in the Tokugawa period that regular widespread production of kamaboko is documented. Even well after the Meiji Restoration, the making of kamaboko remained artisanal, localized and small in scale, dependent on unpredictable and seasonal local catches of fish, and limited by transportation networks and the slow development of refrigeration facilities. Moreover, through World War II and up until the 1960s, fish remained a relatively small part of the Japanese diet. Even at its pre-war peak, daily consumption of fish and shellfish was less than 40 grams or 1.3 ounces per person. The development of what was called the West Trawl, Japan's first modern offshore fishery, began in 1908 with the arrival of a British-built trawler in Nagasaki and transformed the kamaboko industry. The Japanese fleet grew quickly over the next two decades and swept the Yellow and East China Seas, initially focusing on high-value fish, especially sea bream. But catches of bream soon declined under intense fishing pressure, and the trawlers increasingly returned to port with bottom species not popular among Japanese consumers, especially croaker. Because of the exceptional gel-forming properties of croaker, it could be transported great distances, even with minimal refrigeration, and still be made into high-quality kamaboko. With more regular supply of raw materials, the kamaboko industry grew rapidly starting in the mid-1920s. Manufacturers remained small scale, however, and even though new mechanical technology was introduced, the production process continued to be labor intensive and never progressed to anything resembling full mass production. The coming of the Pacific War hamstrung not just the Japanese fishing industry, but also kamaboko makers. During the war, as raw material supply plummeted, output and quality declined. After the surrender, however, production recovered remarkably rapidly, despite American and Korean restrictions on Japanese trawling, and kamaboko output surpassed the pre-war peak by 1953. The most important post-war boost to the industry was the development of fish sausage as an inexpensive and popular new consumer item. 
Experimentation with creating sausage from surimi began in the 1930s, but it was only in 1947 when Nippon Suisan pioneered a product combining ground fish with animal fat that the idea took flight. The burgeoning fish sausage industry was buoyed not just by a post-war generation with a taste for fattier foods, animal protein, and Western-style products, but also by technological advances and changes in seafood markets. The development of hydrochloric rubber casings and the approval of chemical preservatives allowed for fish sausages that did not need refrigeration, and automation of the manufacturing process allowed for production at scale. Importantly, fish sausage was initially made from tuna, which was in plentiful supply after the war, and was particularly expensive after the Lucky Dragon incident of 1954, which of course also generated Godzilla, uh, uh, before the Lucky Dragon incident raised public concerns about irradiated seafood from the South Pacific. Whale meat, I should also note, was also widely used. And here's an interesting product that I discovered recently, retro sausage made with whale, promising, quote, the taste and feel of the Showa period. At the same time, production of traditional kamaboko was also on the upswing. The development of cold chains and the development of seafood, and the distribution of seafood products was critical to this growth. For example, the proportion of Japanese households with refrigerators soared from only 10% in 1960 to almost 90% seven years later. The pace of incremental improvements in processing machinery accelerated and boosted productivity. And as personal incomes rose, the consumption of seafood products increased. And with the coming of supermarkets beginning in 1953, standardized products that were convenient and quick to prepare, like kamaboko, were in high demand. Kamaboko manufacturers soon found, however, that Japan's fisheries could not keep up. Although the West Trawl increasingly focused on supplying the kamaboko trade, and Japanese boats kept moving into new fishing grounds along the coastlines of Asia, supply of key species like croaker stagnated limiting further growth in production. The breakthrough that would transform the kamaboko industry came in 1960 from a scientist named Nishitani Kyosuke, who worked at the Hokkaido Fisheries Research Laboratory. Nishitani made a fortuitous discovery while exploring ways of producing fish sausage from Alaska pollock. There had long been a small pollock fishery in Hokkaido, the salted roe of the fish, known as tarako, had a market in Japan and was highly prized in Korea, where pollock was a major commercial species. But Japanese consumers had no taste for pollock, which has soft flesh that spoils quickly after catch. Pollock was considered a trash fish, and beyond seasonal roe harvesting, was either used for fish meal production or discarded as waste. What Nishitani found was that if sugars like glucose or sucrose were added to Pollock surimi, it could be frozen for long periods of time without the loss of its gel forming properties. For the Neri Sehin industry, this meant not only that a previously underutilized plentiful species was now available for kamaboko, it also meant that producers were no longer dependent on fluctuating supplies of fresh fish. Frozen surimi, a new commodity, could be produced anywhere on the globe, stored indefinitely, and could in sufficient quantities allow at last for full-scale flow mass production of fish paste products from harvest through final packaging and distribution. While Hokkaido pollock catches declined in the late 1950s, another far richer source of raw materials soon presented itself. Japanese trawlers working the waters of the Eastern Bering Sea off the coast of Alaska, chasing bottom fish like sole and flounder, also discovered an abundance of pollock. 
1965, the world's first factory ship equipped to process frozen surimi on board worked the Bering Sea. The size of the Pollock resources were such that other Japanese factory ships and stern trawlers were soon outfitted and trawlers were reallocated from the stagnant West Trawl to Alaskan waters. The Surimi boom of the late 1960s and early 70s was stunning. Pollock catches increased almost fourfold between 1965 and 1972. Frozen Surimi production from the Bering Sea and the Gulf of Alaska swelled from 8,000 tons in 1965 to a peak of almost 218,000 tons in 1973 when 22 factory ships worked the waters. In 1973, Kamaboko production hit an all-time record of 1.2 million tons, 90 of it, 90% 90 of it produced from frozen Pollock surimi, and the Pollock fishery, which had hardly registered in Japanese national statistics before 1965, made up fully one-third of the Japanese fishing industry's total catch. But the boom, needless to say, could not last. Environmental limitations were one issue. After a decade of heavy exploitation, even the very rich Pollock fishery was showing signs of stress. An even greater concern was the apparent saturation of the Japanese Neriseihin market. In 1973, a remarkable 37% of Japanese seafood consumption was in the form of kamaboko but consumers soon tired of so much fish paste, especially as low temperature freezing technology and rising incomes boosted the supply of and demand for higher end seafood products like tuna and salmon. Kamaboko consumption plateaued in the 1970s and then began a long-term decline that continues to the present. Technological innovation helped avert a complete bust in the surimi industry, however. In the early 1970s, two Japanese kamaboko producers developed kanikama, imitation crab meat, made from flavored and flaked surimi. Described as, quote, the greatest achievement of the post-war seafood processing industry, a crab stick was a commercial hit in Japan, and was soon a runaway success internationally, especially in the United States, where it was cannily marketed to food service firms and where crab prices were skyrocketing due to the collapse of the Alaskan king crab fishery in 1980. Not surprisingly, perhaps, Japan's domination of the Pollock fishery off the coast of Alaska, its development of a new processed food commodity, and a surge in Japanese crab stick exports caught the attention of American fishing interests and politicians. The onslaught of Japanese imitation crab, a new staple in Subway sandwiches and California rolls, was dramatically described by one seafood industry analyst as a Sputnik moment for US fishers and processors. With Alaskan crabbers suffering, calls to Americanize the Pollock fishery grew louder and helped accelerate the oceanic enclosure movement, which had been building steam since World War II in the United States and globally. In 1976, Washington declared a 200-mile fishery conservation zone, later formalized as an exclusive economic zone, or EEZ, along America's coasts essentially absorbing all the ground where Japan had been harvesting Pollock and producing surimi into U.S. national territory. Under the American Fisheries Promotion Act of 1980, new criteria were established for fishing rights in U.S. waters, later dubbed the Fish and Chips Policy, that traded catch quotas for improved market access or investments in the American seafood industry. Under fish and chips, just as American policymakers had planned, Japanese boats were progressively excluded from harvesting Pollock in the US EEZ. But Japan's influence in the surimi industry did not simply disappear. 
the big Japanese seafood companies began investing in joint, vec joint venture factory ships and in onshore surimi processing facilities in Alaska from the mid-1980s. So while U.S. fishers came to monopolize the Pollock capture fishery, the larger surimi industry was not Americanized, but instead was globalized, integrated into transnational supply and production chains with substantial Japanese involvement in processing, trade, and distribution, and key Japanese contributions of capital, knowledge, and technology. The ripples from Japan's ouster from the Alaska Pollock fishery did not end there, however. In the 1970s, a significant population of Pollock was discovered in an area called the Donut Hole, part of the Aleutian Basin outside American and Soviet territorial waters. The Japanese trawlers displaced by fish and chips headed straight for these unclaimed grounds in the mid-1980s and were soon joined by fleets of Soviet, Korean, Polish, and Chinese ships. The catch was phenomenal, rising to 1.7 million tons in 1987, but the subsequent collapse was equally dramatic. Only 10,000 tons were harvested from the donut, donut hole in 1992, and by 2007, the Pollock biomass in the area had declined by 98% from its peak. One scientist later described the emptying of the donut hole as, quote, among the most spectacular fishery collapses to occur in the modern history of fisheries in the Northern Hemisphere. With each setback, however, Japanese scientists and fisheries firm, firms just seemed to work harder to find untapped new sources of fish to provide raw material for domestic kamaboko demand, and jobs for Japanese fishers and processors. Inevitably, this involved looking further down the marine food web to find species that were not well suited to surimi production or were long considered unfit for human consumption. In the 1960s and 70s, for instance, government labs discovered means of producing low quality commercial surimi from dark fleshed fish like atka mackerel, Species long harvested mainly for fish meal, like Pacific whiting, became significant sources of surimi, as did a variety of tropical fish, especially threadfin bream, usually considered a trash fish in Southeast Asia. Even giant squid were not safe, as more than 5,000 tons of, of surimi a year were produced in Peru until stocks diminished. And amazingly enough, Japanese government scientists managed to produce serviceable surimi from Antarctic krill in the 1970s before abandoning the project, at least for the time being. So where does this, all this leave us today? 906 years after a plate of chikuwa first graced a Heian banquet. Well, today, surimi and kamaboko are truly global industries. Up to 70% of the surimi produced today is traded internationally, and both surimi and crab sticks are made around the globe. Today, the largest imitation crab factory in the world is either in Plungay, Lithuania, or in Motley, Minnesota. And between them, they produce more fish paste in a year than Japan as a whole did before World War II. Local catches may still be used for craft kamaboko in coastal Japan, but after a century of draining fish stocks across the Pacific and venturing ever further down the food web for marine protein, surimi is produced from dozens of species of fish and invertebrates from all the major oceans in the world. Japan is still a major player in the production and consumption of fish paste products, but the surimi and kamaboko industries have very much paralleled the rise and fall of Japanese fisheries over the 20th century. Japan's fishing industry was the world's largest from the early 1930s until 1988, with the exception of a few years during and after World War II. 
Japan was also the world's largest exporter of seafood products through that period. The same forces that hit Japan's capture fisheries, depletion of fish stocks, territorialization of important fishing grounds, rising oil and labor prices, also hamstrung the fleets that supplied the surimi industry. Other winds buffeted Japanese seafood exports, which slipped from the world's top spot in 1978. Growing domestic demand, the politics of trade liberalization, foreign exchange swings, and the globalization of marine supply chains. The new millennium brought dramatic drops in Japanese kamaboko consumption and production. The number of kamaboko manufacturers in Japan plunged from over 3,000 in the 1980s to under 2,000 in 2005 to only 900 in 2011. Analysts direly predicted further declines to what were called cultural consumption levels, that is, for use mainly as a New Year's tradition, and the relegation of fish sausage to distribution as emergency provisions. And that's a role that fish sausage performed perfectly uh, after the triple disasters uh, of 311. Kamaboko's troubles have certainly been related to a long-term shift away from fish and toward meat, especially young, among younger generations of Japanese consumers. And even intensive marketing aimed at youth, enthusiastically led by ever chipper and presumably extremely elastic mascots of the Kamaboko industry, Kamapi and Chikoru, has been unable to turn the tide. In closing then, at last, I suspect I am not alone in feeling that it seems quite odd, even perverse perhaps, to be spending so much time thinking about Japanese fish paste in the midst of a grueling and deadly global pandemic. At the current moment, it is perfectly understandable, I think, that the industrialization of the oceans, fishing down marine food webs, and the advance of engineered seafood is unlikely to make any of our top 10 or top 100 or even top 1,000 lists of things to worry about. But they probably should, as the same kind of intensive environmental exploitation, acute commercial competition, rapid technological innovation, and relentless global demand for seafood products that fueled the rise of surimi and the transformation of the kamaboko industry is sure to continue to drive world fisheries. So, even if that distinctive elasticity doesn't put you off Kamaboko, the vision of global oceans swept clean for yet another imitation crab stick just might. Thank you so much. I look forward to your questions and comments. And I will stop sharing. Thank you for a fascinating presentation. Um, <clears throat> I've got lots of questions, but I'd like to give the audience a chance to share their questions. You can either raise your hand using um, the logo there, and I can call on you, or if you write up questions, um, you can go up to uh, the top right corner of your screen and click on the shapes and then click on Q&A. Um, and, and write a question um, there. So uh, I can't see everyone for raised hands. I can't see the entire room. So it's probably safest if you write a question into the Q&A. Um, uh, uh, perhaps I can start off. I have a, a few different topics, areas that I'm curious about. Um, I This idea of factory ships, uh, as you probably know, you know, there's this classic short story, the factory ship Kani Kosen, kind of a Marxist short story from the 1920s about the terrible conditions on these ships. And um, I was wondering if, you know, you had any information on this, if this has improved, if, you know, contemporary ships are better labor conditions or if this is something, you know, the Japanese are recruiting um, less expensive uh, laborers from China and Southeast Asia to, to do these kinds of tasks or, or, you know, if you have any information about factory ships. 
Thanks so much for asking about that, Nancy. That's a topic that really does fascinate me. And as I've been thinking about the Cerimi industry, I've increasingly been thinking about a larger project that looks at the industrialization of the oceans, uh, starting in the latter part of the 19th century. So factory ships began uh, in Europe, and they began specifically in the whaling industry, uh, where it was uh, a huge competitive advantage if rather than every time you caught a whale, you had to drag it to land uh, to strip the uh, uh, fat off to boil it down, that could happen at sea. Uh, and so uh, experimentation began really towards the middle of the 19th century uh, on uh, how to do that. Uh, the Japanese, though, were pioneers uh, in uh, 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 developing factory ships for the crabbing industry uh, and for putting canning technology on board ships. Uh, and that famous uh, Kobayashi uh, short story, uh, 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 Kani Kosen, uh, you know, gives a wonderful picture of uh, uh, the grueling life uh, that uh, the workers faced uh, on these ships. I mean, it's a fascinating uh, phenomenon because not just is it taking industry uh, to the ocean, but it's also very much taking class struggle uh, to the ocean. It is creating a, a sort of marine proletariat of workers who are essentially working on floating sweatshops, uh, uh, cleaning crab uh, and processing them uh, for canning, which was a huge uh, export industry for Japan uh, before uh, World War II. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the technology of these ships improved greatly over time. The scale grew as well. Over time, Japan became one of the leaders. Japan and Germany were real pioneers in the technology uh, of uh, factory ships. But I will say uh, the uh, life of a laborer on those ships has not improved as dramatically as their productivity. Uh, uh, that is to say, it is still uh, uh, a pretty uh, 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 loud, unpleasant, and dangerous place to work. Uh, and that's one reason why, uh, you know, starting really in the 1960s, but accelerating in the 1970s, there were very few Japanese workers left on these ships, uh, but they were mostly uh, people from developing nations uh, who were uh, willing uh, to have that kind of uh, uh, dirty, dangerous uh, uh, job. Today, Japan's out of the industry. Uh, no more factory ships uh, left uh, in Japan, uh, but they still exist under a variety uh, of different flags today. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I Things aren't appearing in Q&A. I don't really know this tool, Google Meet, so well. I've seen a couple of comments pop up, but then they disappeared immediately. So perhaps um, if you have a question, you can just turn your mic off and, and just speak your question. I'm not sure. Is, is there a chat function? Besides uh, you and Nancy, I? Nancy yeah. in the middle, there is a, a in the middle of top right on the oh, top right yeah. in the middle. Oh, yeah. no? yes. Click that. Thank you. So, um, Chris, Christine says thank you, Professor Tsui, for a wonderful and engaging presentation. Um, uh, and then the, the question is: Would you advocate streaming as a health food? Is it sustainable? And do you personally eat surimi? Why or why not? <laughs> Boy, a lot of difficult questions uh, in there. Uh, and hi, Christine. It's good to see you again. Christine is at uh, MIT. Uh, uh, you know, uh, certainly the industry has promoted uh, uh, surimi and kamaboko uh, as uh, a health food. Uh, and, you know, to the extent that um, the Japanese fishing industry has been able to moderate the decline of fish uh, as opposed to meat in the Japanese diet. I think it's largely been for health reasons. Uh, just as in this country, uh, fish has been seen as, uh, you know, a, a, a good for you alternative uh, to fatty meats. Uh, and that has worked in Japan as well. You know, I've read so many interesting articles about the health benefits uh, of surimi. Of course, everything possible is claimed for it. You know, it helps your digestion, it helps your complexion, it helps the, you know, iron in your bones, you name it, somebody has studied it. One of the most fascinating ones I read recently was about the hazards of eating uh, kamaboko for elderly people because of the ashi. Every year in Japan, there are several dozen emergency room incidents where an old person has dislocated their jaw from eating odawara kamaboko. <laughs> 
So this article I read actually makes the recommendation that the industry should be thinking as the population ages of shifting to softer Kamaboko products, which I think like Humpen, which I think is actually uh, sort of hilarious. The sustainability question is a really, you know, uh, a difficult one. Uh, you know, the American Pollock industry makes the case very strongly that Pollock is the world's largest sustainable fishery. Uh, I would like to believe them, but I also know that the size of that fishery is so great uh, that they have been able to harvest uh, 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 very heavily for a very long time simply because uh, it is so large and has not was not exploited for so long. Uh, uh, and so uh, only time will tell uh, how good the management techniques are. Uh, as I think we all know, marine scientists tend to be a little bit over optimistic sometimes about sustainable production of wild seafood. Uh, farmed seafood is now used uh, in some surimi products uh, as well. And yet, as we know, there are questions about aquaculture too, uh, because it turns out that uh, one of the main uh, feed products used in aquaculture is fish meal. Uh, 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 and fish meal uh, uh, has become a major environmental concern uh, because these ships have been going around the world, sweeping the oceans clean uh, of uh, uh, some of the important uh, sort of uh, species that uh, other organisms depend on. Uh, and so aquaculture too is responsible for a lot of wild fish being caught and stocks being uh, 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 depleted. Uh, so, you know, um, uh, uh, even if I loved uh, uh, Kamaboko, I don't think I would eat too much of it. Uh, uh, moderation uh, in everything is probably the way. Uh, and uh, uh, my wife continues talking to me about becoming a vegan. Uh, uh, not soon, perhaps, but it may happen. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there's Another question from Jennifer Califf. It, she says, I've always wondered if it's possible to make any type of surimi from freshwater fish or is it strictly marine? Would it be a traditional thing? Just thinking about how gefilte fish is often made from rough fish species. That is a great question, Jennifer, and not something I've uh, engaged with too much. You know, uh, I've read a lot of historical materials uh, on uh, 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 Kamaboko production, and I have not seen uh, freshwater fish being used uh, uh, for making kamaboko. You know, I have to believe that it is possible uh, to do so biologically, that there are, I suspect, the same proteins uh, in freshwater fish. But for whatever reason, I have not seen, even for places, uh, you know, uh, around lakes in Japan with uh, freshwater fisheries, I've not seen a lot of material uh, on producing kamaboko in that form. I will say, if you go online, you will see that there is um, uh, someone who runs a blog, uh, and this is a person that goes to uh, yard sales in the United States and collects recipes that people have handwritten, often on index cards. Then she puts the recipes online uh, and makes the dish and see, sees how it turns out. One of these she has is for homemade kamaboko from a Japanese woman in California that she found at an estate sale. And I believe that might have used freshwater fish in it, just out of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, convenience uh, of having that available. I think there's somebody in the Central Valley, if I remember correctly. So I think it might technically be possible and it could be sort of fun. Uh, it would be interesting to take the recipe we're about to see uh, from the Austin chef uh, and try doing it uh, with uh, 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 a freshwater species. Um, I want to be conscious of time. I think that we're scheduled until two. Kako, uh, the video is seven minutes long. Is that correct? Seven. Yes, yeah, seven to eight. Okay, so there is a final question from Peter Vo. Do we have time to take that before the video? Yep. Okay. Sure. Peter Vo asks, did the Pollock fishery in the donut hole recover? And if so, how long did it take? What keeps depletion from occurring again to the same degree in that area? It's a good question without a happy answer, unfortunately. It has not recovered uh, even to today. Uh, uh, it was really fished out uh, in that uh, time. And we have, you know, I think uh, uh, 
humans tend to have a very uh, optimistic view of the ability of nature to regenerate itself, uh, but sometimes the damage was is so severe uh, that it might take uh, centuries, if not longer, uh, for that to come back. And frankly, the equilibrium of species might be so upset that it never happens. Uh, and so uh, the donut hole uh, 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 is one of the tragedies, uh, I think, uh, of modern fisheries. We've seen this uh, overfishing happen other places where the return did uh, occur. We've seen it slowly, for example, even in the cod fishery uh, of the North Atlantic. But uh, uh, it does seem that one particular area that was so heavily hit uh, 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 is not come back. Okay, um, thank you for your questions. Great questions. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Kazu Fukumoto, who will be um, in this video uh, about using, making hampen, I believe. So um, uh, Kazu Fukumoto is the chef and owner of Fukumoto Sushi in Yakitori Izakaya in Austin. He was born in Fukuoka, Japan, on the northern shore of Kyushu Island. Um, and in 1999, he began his culinary career um, starting as a dishwasher at Musashino, a, a very, one of the first quality Japanese restaurants in Austin. Um, of the oh, now she frozen. I'm That's frozen? Ah, no, I'm okay. It's okay. 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 Um, so let's see. In, in 2000, September of 2015, all of his hard work paid off when he opened Fukumoto Sushi and Yakitori Izakaya serving up traditional Japanese cuisine in a casual gastropub setting. He loves to share his passion for food with everyone around him and continues to do so with his evolving menu. Um, so I'm, I believe um, uh, there will be a video um, showing a, a preparation of um, Surimi products. Okay, thank you, Nancy and Sui uh, Sensei. Koike san, onegaishimasu. Oh, okay. There we go. Hi, I'm Kazu from uh, Fukumoto Restaurant. Today I'm going to make a Surimi Tofu Hamburg. Here's the ingredients. Okay, I got the salt, pepper, egg, and carrots, green beans, and potato starch, and this is hijiki seaweed. Hijiki seaweed usually comes in a dry, so you're adding water to make it soft. Then after you made it soft, make sure you dry it out. And of course, here's the surimi right here. Today we're using the snapper surimi, but it's really hard to get it. So well, here's the alternate. It's called a hampen. Either hijiki or a hampen you can find in the Asahi imports on the Barnet Road. Let me explain what hampen is. Hampen is a white square triangle or round surimi products with a soft and mild taste. It is believed to have been invented during the Edo period in Japan by Chef Hampei of Suruga and the dish is named after him. It can be eaten as a ingredient in oden or soup. It can also be fried or boiled. And this one was made from a grated Japanese mountain yam, uh, surimi Alaska pollock, salt, and then seaweed stock, which is kombudashi. Okay, here's how you cook it. It's super easy. It's very healthy too. So first surimi into your food processor and tofu, basically everything except all these. Eggs, and then potato starch. Okay. And until it gets smooth, you just put it in and cook it. Just one pinch of pepper and then one pinch of salt, just a little bit more. 
After this done, we're just going to make it into a small bowl and just tap it, tap it, tap it, tap it. It's just like a small burger. And it is very fluffy, so very careful, nice and soft. And the bowl. And we're just going to go ahead and cook it. About medium, medium high heats, and just a little bit of oil. Let's see. And just carefully place your tofu bird. It's very fluffy, so be careful. Okay. Until the surface gets kind of golden brown. While we're cooking this, uh, we'll make the teriyaki sauce. Here's the ingredients. Three tablespoons of water. Three tablespoons of soy sauce. Three tablespoons of sake. Three tablespoons of uh, mirin. And then one teaspoon of uh, sugar and then half a teaspoon of a potato starch. It can be cornstarch. And, and then make sure you dissolve it very well. Let's see. Those liquids, you just mix it. Just need to boil it. Plates, whatever you like, salads, tomato, however you want it. And just place the tofu burger. And then the teriyaki sauce. Okay, this is very nice and healthy tofu burger. Enjoy! Thank you very much to Chef Fukumoto and again to Dr. William Tsutsui and to Kakoito and the Japan America Society of Greater Austin. Um, this has been a, a fun and informative presentation. So uh, thank you again for allowing me to take part in it. Kako, do you have any closing words? Uh, yes.